it was judgment day for a young guy named Jose uh, in my dad's office uh, several years ago. Uh, my dad was the district director uh, in Southern California with U.S. Customs. And so he was in the federal building. His office faced the Coronado Island. It was a really tough place to work. Uh, his view was amazing. Uh, so when I would go up to see him, uh, they were usually had uh, SWAT-type teams loading up with weapons and stuff to do raids and things. And, you know, I'd walk in, hey, Marty, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, I guess you're going to work today. And an interesting place. And uh, there was a young man in my dad's office one day with his mom. Uh, and his mom was uh, very irate that she was not going to pay the fine that was levied against her son for smuggling an exotic bird in the United States from Mexico. She just wasn't going to pay it. And she wanted to talk to the head man <laughs> to convince him to drop all charges and to drop the fee that was levied against her boy. And so my dad said, hey, you know, come on in. I'll meet, I'll meet with you. So the lady came in. She sat down. And, uh, and my dad said, why don't you explain to me, uh, just what did Jose tell you? You know, because uh, you know, yeah, he was arrested by the, the agent uh, and et cetera. So like, what exactly did he tell you occurred? Well, she said, well, here's what happened. You know, my son is totally innocent. What he was doing, seeing family members in Tijuana as he's coming across the border. Uh, had, it was a hot day. His air conditioning wasn't working. He had the windows down. I, you got to let me tell the story. That's, you know, okay. Had to, <laughs> he had the windows down. He's approaching the customs officer. Long line of cars going into the United States. He's waiting to get in. The, and this bird flew in the window. <laughs> right. Right. My dinner, our conversations when I grew up were most interesting. Um, this is one of the conversations. And so, I was, oh, that's interesting. So the bird flew in the window. Okay, then what happened? Well, then Jose is trying to guide the car in the line to go to the customs officer. Uh, he's trying to grab the bird with one hand, and that bird was crafty, and it jumped down onto the floorboard. So Jose is still trying to drive the car to the customs officer, trying to grab the bird in the floorboard, and then the bird shot under the seat. <laughs> Couldn't get it. It's out of his reach. And that was just a fortuitous time, because that's exactly when he pulled up to the U.S. customs officer. And the officer, no, the officer didn't see anything. This is not a personal conversation. <laughs> she cracks me up. She, you, you are so attuned with where I'm going. Right. And your point was what? The officer did not see the bird. You would think the officer would see the bird, but the officer did not see the bird. But you're going to find out what the officer saw. It's totally funny. So what happened? Here's what happened. What was I talking about? The bird? So the, the bird. Yeah, the bird. So, so my dad's like, okay, so the bird went under the seat. That's when you saw the officer, right? So, so that's when the officer had like a sixth sense that something's going on here. You know what I'm saying? Something's fishy. And my dad always said, officers have a sixth sense. They just have it, right? Are you an officer? Some kind of officer? You kind of just read there's criminal activity going on. I don't know what it is. And that was my dad. He would find cocaine and stuff. And they're like, how did you find it? There's just something about that guy. You know, so it was that, that kind of mystical thing. So they pull him into secondary, check the car, and his mom said that's when they find the bird under the seat. And, you know, that's why it's not his problem. It just crawled under there. My dad, that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, the mom believed it, you know. And so it's like, let me, my dad said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I will reduce all charges of why a sponge is this record, everything, if you can answer one question. She's like, oh, tell me, shoot. Uh, and he said, okay, um, the bird flew in the window, correct? Yes. Uh, it crawled down onto the floorboard. Yes. It went under the seat. Yes. Explain to me, how did it wind up in a paper sack? <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah, it was a sack. The sack was under the seat, happened to be open, facing the right direction. Bird went into it. Right. So then my dad said, okay, then I want to know, how did it tape its bill closed? Ooh. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And then my dad said, how did it tape the bag closed? <laughs> That's some kind of bird, isn't it? Now, do you think the lady paid the fine? Yeah. yeah, she paid the fine. She had nothing, nada to say. That was it. The narrow came out, paid the fine. That, okay, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being, that was a really awesome excuse. Zero, lame, beyond measure. How would you class it? Because you can rate lame excuses. If you have children, you understand what I'm saying. So <laughs> why didn't you make curfew? All the reasons why. Yeah. So anyway, so this is this a 10, good, good excuse, zero, lame excuse. I'm choosing one or zero. Negative you got to be kidding me. Especially as the information unfolds. Couldn't have seen the bird. The tail feathers aren't sticking out. You get more information. That's totally lame. Now, what has that got to do with anything about theology? Everything. <laughs> 
everything. My dad's telling me this. I'm like, whoa. Because I read Matthew chapter 7. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says on judgment day, people are going to stand before my throne, before the living God, and argue with me by giving me their best excuses as to why they rejected me and I should, they should walk into my heaven. Like what? Well, Jesus lists the excuses that he hears that day. Like what? Do you know the passage? He says, many, many will come to me on that day and they will say, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not cast out demons, heal this, do this, do this. And Jesus says, I listen, and I listen to the argumentation. <clears throat> Imagine the audacity of arguing at the throne of the resurrected Christ on judgment day. He says, I look at them and I make one pronouncement. You know the pronouncement? Probably the most foreboding thing you would want to ever hear from the living God. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Translated, lame excuse. And then he adds something, a little proviso. What's he say? I what? I never knew you. Now you got to stop and ask yourself a theological question. Does God know all things? Yeah. So that makes you very should make you we're very quizzical about why did he say that because when you read it in the greek text he chooses a word that identifies specifically what he means by no he says when i say i don't know you he says i don't ginosko you that means i have no experiential knowledge of you he, if he would have chose the other greek word for knowledge it's oida that means i know something abstractly and totally get it he says i'm god i oida all things but when it comes down to a relationship between me and you, never had one because your works bypassed me and the cross and the resurrection. Therefore, I don't know you. Therefore, lame excuse. Lame excuse. Paul is going to talk about lame excuses in uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. He's going to piggyback like on what Jesus is talking about. And he's going to say like on judgment day, all the lost who reject the gospel and God's revelation of himself to them will be without excuse because God gave them enough evidence to know why they should embrace the gospel of Christ. They will be without excuse. He tells us this in verse 18. Notice verse 18. It's the bad news of the gospel. He just spent the other half of the, of the, of the chapter talking about the greatness of the gospel to redeem a sinner, save a sinner. And now he's going to say the bad news is if you reject the gospel of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And what do they do? They suppress the truth. And he tells, he tells you, they do it in the field of unrighteousness. Then he says, because that which is known to them, he's going to give you the reasons why God's judgment is, is valid. The reason is because what is known about them is evident within them. Uh, for God made it evident to them. Well, how do you do that? Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been what? Clearly seen. Being understood through what? That which is made. What's the, uh, what's the end result of that, that witness? So they're without excuse. So that when they stand before him, uh, he can say, Bad ex that bird thing, it's not going to work here. That whole thing, uh, you worked your way into my presence, won't work here. Bad excuse. And what's he say? For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they made the great exchange. Uh, but they became futile in their speculations. Foolish, their foolish heart was darkened. Notice the cause effect. When you reject truth of God, you, it's a downward spiral. Uh, professing to be wise, in God's eyes, they are what? You're a fool. You're a fool. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image of, in the form of a corruptible man. And they also did, well, they worshiped birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. So you reject God, that he exists, and that he has sent his son to be your savior and rose from the grave the third day. When you reject truth, everything else past that is a downward spiral to chaos and to oblivion. Because God says you're without excuse. He's going to give you two reasons why judgment day uh, uh, is valid. The wrath is valid. Because everybody's like, God wouldn't do that. God would Yes, yes, he would. He tells you he is. Uh, why is God's wrath against sinners valid? He's going to give you two reasons. Number one, because God's revelation is resisted. That's the first point. It's resisted. Is it not? I mean, notice what he says. Who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You can't suppress something unless you know it. You follow? It's, it's, you're suppressing that which you know. They do it unrighteously in an ungodly way. Uh, do you like to swim? Just like, not right now, right? I mean, it's kind of cold, but. And what do they do with swimming pools around here? I, you know? 
Do they, do they, do they drain them? I don't know. But when you do get a chance to jump in a pool, what I like to do is get a big ball and try to submerge the thing. You know what I'm talking about? You do this. I do corny things. It's true. <laughs> Shove it under the water, jump on top of it, and then try to float on it and hold it there. There's a center of gravity thing. So if somebody's diving around you, it's going to mess you up because you're going to probably, it's coming out. Or if somebody's making waves or whatever. But you want to kind of put that under the water, see how long you can float on it. It really works the abs, like you can tell. Just keep working on it. <laughs> and you guys are so gracious. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, but that's suppression, is it not? And I, I did this all the time with my kids. It's like, Dad, how are you staying in the deep end? I'm just awesome, you know? And I, there's a ball, you know? But, but that ball had the tendency to come out, right? So when, when he, it talks about the truth of the gospel and the reality of the existence of God, Paul says, non-believers, and we all were born this way, suppress the truth. That's just what we do by definition. We don't want to believe it because we know it's there, so we suppress it. Now, I, I, if you read my notes tomorrow, you can read the eight lexical meanings of the word suppression, and you'll come to the conclusion it means suppression. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, sometimes when you're studying those Greek words, you're like, wow, where's this going? Nowhere. It just means what it means. Other times it leads to something amazing. Uh, this is just suppression, holding something at bay. I don't want to believe that. I don't like that. It's going to mess with my life. Trust in Jesus. Believe in the Bible. Uh-uh. I'm opting for this. Suppression is everywhere. Um, I'm taking two doctoral classes to finish my doctorate in apologetics right now. Uh, and they're both on, uh, they're advanced classes on cults. It's very interesting. And I know, it's not that I don't know anything about them. But I have never sat down and read all the cultic books from beginning to end, all their doctrinal books. That's what I'm having to do. Uh, and so it's been very enlightening to read all of their writings, uh, just not listening what somebody quoted about they said, but to read the whole thing. It's, it's unbelievable. So I'm just about done. I'll finish this afternoon. Uh, all of the doctrinal books for Jehovah's Witness theology. I've been doing this hours like every day. And it's been most enlightening because I have family members who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and, uh, and all I can do is I'm reading them. I've got my little pen, my highlighter, as suppression, 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 suppression of truth. Why? Because they don't want to embrace the true Jesus. Notice what they say about Jesus. And ask yourself when I read this to you. This is one of, one of their doctrinal books. Do I believe this? Here's what they say. Notice the suppression. Quote, Jesus is Jehovah's most precious son and for good reason. Period. Do you believe that? It's not a trick question. Is Jesus God's most precious son? You agree, you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. Sounds good so far. Then notice the suppression. He is called the firstborn of all creation. Why? Well, for he was God's first creation. Do alarms ever go off in your brain when you're reading? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, me, me too. You know, it's like, uh, okay, I believe the first half I don't believe the last half. What have they done? They've suppressed the truth of who Jesus is. Why? Their presupposition is he's not God. He's a God. He's a demiurge of God. He's not Jehovah. That's a kind of a problem because in John 8:58, Jesus says, I'm the I am. But that's a whole nother sermon and a whole nother day. But they, they don't believe he's God. So all of a sudden, what they give on one hand, they take away on the other hand to create a false concept of God so they can have their own version of religion, which is devoid of what truth is. And by the way, like what, because a young man asked me the other day, he said, Pastor, what is a cult? Good question. What is a cult? Well, it's, it's, a, it's an organization that takes truth, biblical truth, and changes it by a few degrees theologically and devises an entire system of belief around it that's divorced from the reality of what it really is. That's cultic activity. So that means we're not talking about a new, new type of religion, uh, like a world religion, like Shintoism or Taoism. That, that's a world religion. We're talking about cultic activity deviating from truth of what the Bible says. The Bible says Jesus is, is God himself. Jesus said that himself. And here they're saying, uh, no, that's not him. Dr. Ron Rhodes, this is from Colossians 1.15, about Christ being the firstborn of all creation. Dr. Ron Rhodes, who's a uh, scholar, and it comes, he, he deals with cultic uh, teachings. Here, no, notice what he says about how they interpret Colossians 1.15. Quote, Jehovah's Witnesses have, strongly, uh, mis have wrongly misunderstood Colossians 1.15 to mean that there was a time when God, Christ did not exist and that he came into being at a point in time because he's a created being. Firstborn 
does not mean, the Greek word, first created. Rather, as Greek scholars agree, and I took six years of Greek, so I knew, I knew a little bit about the Greek, uh, the word prototokos means first in rank, eminent. It says the word carries the idea of positional preeminence of supremacy. Christ is the firstborn in the sense that he is positionally preeminent over creation and supreme over all things. He is also the heir of all creation in the sense that all that belongs to the Father belongs to him. Why? He's God. Firstborn. Jehovah's Witness says, no, it means first created and then everything was created uh, after that. No, it's not what the word means. That Greek word means preeminent one. Always. I find interesting, uh, Psalm chapter 89, verse 27. That's very interesting because there Jehovah God says that he will make David, the king, the firstborn. Go back to the Old Testament and ask yourself, uh, of all the, when Samuel went to uh, the home to get the king of Israel, the new king to replace you know, Saul, when he went to the, and he's looking at all the sons inside the house, you're not him, you're not him, you're not him, you're not him. What happened? He said, is this all your sons? Yeah, uh, uh, there's another one. You know, my, my youngest son is out back tending the sheep. What did the prophet say? I, I, let me see him. Who was the king? David. Was David the firstborn? No. What did God just say? I'm going to take David, who's not the firstborn, make him the firstborn. That just told you that firstborn doesn't mean created first. It's preeminent one. So implied to Jesus, it's not telling you he's the created one. He's telling you he's first and foremost a preeminent one. You see what I mean? Talk about suppression, you know what I'm saying? Um, then there's, a, there's another doctrinal book. It's about 400 pages long. I'm going to finish it this afternoon. Um, that's what I do when I go home. What do you do? You know? uh, and, uh, so I've you know, got to stay on my reading schedule because I have to have so many pages a day. Uh, and so this book is, uh, I'm going to finish it off. But I was reading it the other day, and, it, and the title of the book is, What Does the Bible Really Teach? And that word really is italicized on the front of their book. So I want to know, whoa, what does it really teach? I must have been misled. So it's all alphabetized because it's like an encyclopedia, which makes for exciting reading. So when you, <laughs> when you get to the section, the letter B, I'm like near Z now, but when you get to B on baptism, I'm like, oh, this should be interesting. They say this, notice the suppression. Quote, water baptism is a requirement for all who want to have a relationship with Jehovah God. Hmm? Your alarm's going off? I don't know. I'm kind of thinking about some other verses like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, where Paul said, you know the passage? For by grace are you saved? Through faith, Through faith mm, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his create, you know, creation, you know, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, etc. I mean, I thought about salvation was based on faith and grace not on faith plus all this other stuff. And as I've read their book, I've made all kinds of notations on, okay, they added, so they say you gotta believe in God, check, that's good. Then they added baptism, huh? And then they add a whole bunch of other things that I've noted all throughout the book. Remember, it's kinda like control. It's control, because it's cultic activity. See, it's a suppression of truth, because I don't like the truth of Jesus. I'm gonna give you a false version of Jesus and call it the true version of Jesus. Suppression, what did Paul say? You're without excuse on judgment day, if you suppress the truth, because the truth is there. Notice what Paul says uh, about um, truth. He says in verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident where? What does it say? Evident where? It's evident to them. He also says it's evident within them. It's in them. What do you mean? Well, Paul says you're born knowing that there's a God. You're born knowing that the gospel rings true with all this other stuff. Because if you really are saved by faith in God plus all your other works, whatever they may be, you'll never know you're saved. You'll never know. You'll never know. What's Paul say? They, they know this truth within themselves, the truth that there is a God and he has a gospel of good news for sinners. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3, I don't know if you've read it. It was a big uh, chapter in the, in the 60s uh, because uh, the birds picked it up and wrote a song about it. Remember the birds? Uh, yeah, major heavy metal band in that day and time. Uh, yeah. Remember the song? What's the song? Turn, turn, turn. I love that song. I love that song. And then I found out it was in the Bible. When you can validate your rock music on the Bible, even better to your parents. <laughs> Say it. Mom, I can listen to this. Um, 
I'm just saying. And so uh, when you read Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon says, when you look at time, there's a time for everything, right? There's time for weddings. There's times for uh, a, 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 a wife to pass away. There's ups and downs of life. It's life. That's what Solomon says. And you look at your life and you're like, man, the birds had it right because they got it from Solomon. And then what's he say in verse 11? He, who's he? God. What has he done? He's made everything appropriate, all your ups and downs, triumphs and tragedies in, life, in time. That's true. And then, then he adds this little statement. He has also done what? Set eternity where? In their heart. Your heart. What's that mean? That means I know there's eternity. It's built into the warp and woof of my being. I can't get away from it. I can't get away from it. You know, one of my friends, uh, my, da my dad's best friend, uh, he was on Iwo Jima as a Marine. And I asked Nick one time, because he was eventually shot by a sniper six times. And I asked him, what was it like? So what was it like, Nick, to land on Iwo Jima? And he, he told me what it was like. And he said, well, I don't, he said, what I found most interesting was the guys who were the atheistic skeptics on the troop ships, when we got on those landing barges, and the gate came down, and I'm running through the machine gun fire and the mortar fire with my BAR. He said, I watched guys in shell holes turn white-headed almost instantly from fear. Why? Because those same guys all realized I'm facing more mortality. Is there anything beyond? What, what did Ecclesiastes say through the pen of Solomon? Yes. In your heart, you know, beyond your argumentation, there's eternity. There's eternity. Uh, when I sat with my dad and watched him uh, die from cancer, brain cancer, before I moved here, you cannot tell me. You can't sit in those situations and, as a son and not look at that situation and say, there must be something beyond the horror of this. There is. There is. Paul says it's built into your being that you know that there's eternity. You can't get away from it. You know, it is like what you think about in the middle of the night, those arguments from Christians that your friends have given you that you rebut most readily in their presence, but in the still of the night, those things come back to you and haunt you because you know they're intrinsically true, but you must figure out new ways to run from them. This is what Paul says. It's built in you that you know there's a God. And then he says it's also external. So it's internal, external. So you're, it, you really can't get away. You have internal proof that there's a God in eternity. In, and then he says it's external. Are you kidding me? It's external? Yeah. He says, for since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been obscured from vision. What did he say? Now, clearly seen, clearly seen. Uh, being understood through what has been made, so they, the person, is without excuse. Imagine the analytical person standing before God's throne and saying, I, no judgment on me. I had absolutely no clue whatsoever that you existed. I had zip. I did not understand. What did Paul say? You had enough evidence to reason your way through the evidence that there's a divine being. And when that would occur, God would give you special revelation to point you to Christ. But you rejected the, the general revelation. I don't know. I, when I lived in California, I'm in Northern California for the last 20 years. I love to go to, uh, up to Lake Tahoe because it wasn't far. And one of our parishioners had a place on the lake, private place, gate and everything. It was awesome. Private beach. It was awesome. We went up there all the time. I loved it at night. No light refraction. Go out at night. Beautiful on the lake. Look up at the skies. See the beauty of the lake. The glory, the majesty, etc. See the, the, you know, the bands of the Milky Way you know, stretching out over your heads because you can actually see the stars, you know, congregated together. Who cannot look at that and make some great observations about God? Paul, Paul says his invisible attributes are seen. So God has different kinds of attributes. He has, well, two kinds. He has th what theologians would say are communicable attributes and non-communicable, meaning he gives us some, there's some that he didn't give us. So like, if, if you're married for a moment, just... If you tell your wife, husbands, that just trust me, I know all things, honey. How's that going for you? Is that going to work for you? Right? It's not. Because she's going to look at you and she say, you are not omnipotent and you're definitely not omniscient. Right? Because we all have limitations, right? So those would be things God didn't give us. He didn't give us omnipotence because you can't go to the weight room and pick up the weight stack. Right? Or maybe you can. We need to talk. But... I mean, no way. I mean, so he hasn't given us omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, etc. But there's other things he's given us. Like what? He gave us love, joy, peace, kindness, compassion, 
patience, just never pray for it. It's there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whenever you wonder, does God answer prayer? Ask for patience. He'll answer instantly. Boom. Uh, he, he gives us these things, and Paul says these attributes of God are clearly seen. Why? All I got to do is look up or look around, and it, I can see the fingerprints of God all around me. This, uh, this weekend, we did a, I did an apologetic series on uh, proofs of the presence or the, the four great arguments for the, the fact that there might be a divine being. Here's kind of a summation of those arguments, not all of them, but just like two of them, uh, of why there's evidence that there is a divine being. Uh, cosmologically, the cosmos, the world, there's two versions of the cosmological argument. And, and they go like this. One's horizontal, reasons from cause effect back to, there, if cause effect can't go on to infinity, there has to be, like I asked my mom, I was around eight years old, thinking about cause effect, and I, I went into her room one day and I said, mom, I'm just kind of wondering, Everything it has an effect, there's a cause. And if you go backwards like that, like, could you tell me who made God? <laughs> you ever had that notion as a child? Your children, children every act, dial 1 800. You know, I mean, you know, my mom's looking at me, honey, you just need to go to school. You know, God just is, is what she tells me. Oh, he, he just is. Yeah, he's outside of uh, where we live, he's outside of our domain. He's not caused. He's not caused? No, he's uncaused. See, that's the first part of the cosmological argument. Here's how the premises go. Everything that begins has a cause, right? Uh, thus, the universe had a beginning because we know it had a beginning based on all the stuff you should have heard in the seminar that we talked about this week, scientifically. We know there's a beginning. There was a big bang. There was just a big banger. Okay? The universe had a cause. You have two choices. It was either impersonal or personal, which is more logical that it was personal as opposed to impersonal. Uh, the vertical side of the cosmological argument goes like this. This points not back to how do we account for cause effect because in, in philosophy, you can't have infinite regression with cause effect. It has to hang on something because nothing is self-caused, right? The other, the vertical argument goes this way. Major premise, every contingent being, dependent being like us, uh, 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 that it, it exists uh, has a cause right now. Minor premise, the whole physical universe is contingent right now. We are. I mean, I'm needing lunch here in a few minutes because I'm contingent. Uh, final conclusion, the whole physical universe has a cause right now that it's dependent on. I mean, really, what, he, what holds everything together? Why doesn't it just spin off into absolute chaos? This knife edge of existence, how is that possible? God, it points to God the sustainer. He's the ultimate cause. That's the horizontal argument. He's the sustainer, the vertical argument. Um, for sake of time, we'll skip the next slide. You can see it on, on, a, the, uh, on the website tomorrow. I'm going to look at the, the next argument, the, the uh, teleological argument, argument from design. Pretty simple. If there's a design, there must have been a designer. I mean, why would you, th I, I should look at intrinsic design, complicated design, and assume there's no designer. Uh, well, here's how it goes. Major premise. Whenever we observe specified complexity in the present, such as a human language, it's caused by an intelligent cause. I mean, whoever took Hebrew, Aleph, Bey, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Bam, Zion, Hey, Te, Yod, Kaf, Lam, whoever took all those letters and assigned tonal qualities to them and then agreed that when we say these consonants together, it means X. <laughs> you talk about complicated? Where did that come from? Okay, when you take an olive and a bait together, and you don't put a dot in the middle of the bait, and you make it a, 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 a V sound, of means father. Everybody agree? Yeah. Right, right, right. See, specified complexity speaks of a designer, see? Major premise, specified complexity has an intelligent designer, like language. Life has, a, has specified complexity. Uh, life has an intelligent designer. I mean, if a language has an intelligent designer, why wouldn't life have an intelligent designer? I mean, it just seems the most logical thing to do is to anticipate a designer. I was reading a book, in, a science book the other day, and, and a scientist that deals with DNA code was talking about, I mean, what's the probability that this DNA chain with this alphabetical lettering that's built into it, that's very predictable, how did that come about? Like, I mean, what's the statistical probability it assembled itself? And so it had a page where it ran the numbers and it listed all the zeros of the probability. It was 10 to the 186th power. Meaning, probably after about 10 to the 40th power, 
There's not enough time in the cosmos for it to just happen. Where'd it come from? God. God made it. What does David say in Psalm 19? The heavens are declaring what? The glory of God. You can see the glory of God just by looking up. Uh, Man, look at that information, and what do they do? They resist that. Oh, I don't don't want that. That would mess up my life to have to believe in God and believe in Jesus. What else do they do? They move from resistance to open rejection. That's what Paul says. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him or give thanks, but they came futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. They, the intelligentsia, what they do? Profess to be wise, but before God, what were they? Fools. They exchange the glory. This is the great exchange. You get rid of truth, absolute truth. Everything goes downhill from there. They exchange the glory of God, the incorruptible God, for an image in the form of a corruptible man, birds, four-footed uh, animals, crawling creatures, whatever else worked but God. But God. John Lennox, a uh, mathematician in uh, England, very smart man, uh, a string of letters after his name, MA, PhD, doctorate of philosophy, doctorate of science, blah, 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 smart man. He's a man who loves God, believes in God, and writes to defend the fact that it's logical to believe in the divine one who loves us. But uh, there's another professor, uh, uh, Oxford professor in chemistry, Peter Atkins, uh, who writes this about God. Quote, science, the system of belief founded securely on a publicly shared reproducible knowledge, emerged from religion uh, as Science discarded its chrysalis to become its present butterfly. It took over the heath. He says, there's no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. Really? Only the religious among whom I uh, include not only the prejudiced, but the under-informed. They're not enlightened like me. Hope that there is a dark corner of the physical universe or the universe of experience that science can never hope to eliminate. But science has never, never encountered a barrier, and the only grounds for supposing that reductionism will fail are pessimism on the part of scientists in fear of the minds of the religious. What does he worship? Science. It's called scientism. He says, don't bother me with the facts. My presuppositions are there is no God, therefore I don't care about the evidence. I read it all through my presuppositional grid. There's no God. And by the way, we've been broken free from the chrysalis of uh, religion. We're now the enlightened ones. We know, God says from heaven, you're foolish. You're foolish. You have no excuse. You, instead of looking at the information and seeing the intricacy guides to me, you worship the information. That's your God. On judgment day, Paul says those people are without excuse because they rejected truth that God has built in them and outside of them. So notice that digression. They pro- profess to be wise and smart, etc., and they are smart, but in God's mind, they're foolish. They exchange truth for error. And it all goes down from there, does it not? When you walk away from the truth of God, it only spirals downward to greater complexities. I took a class last semester called Systematic Philosophy. Oh, that sounds exciting. Because I was a grammar guy. I'm taking this class outside of my zone. And we are studying, you know, how Rene Descartes said this. And then it went, his position went to this and went to that. And and you know him, uh, I think, therefore I am. He went away from Thomistic thinking that believes the speaker's really there, even if I'm not thinking about it. That's Thomistic thinking. Descartes came along and said, not quite sure that's there. I think I'm projecting that with my mind. My mind, what I think, is what's important. That could be an illusion. This is radical. So I'm taking this class, and we start with Descartes, and we go from Descartes to the next guy to the next guy, the next guy to Immanuel Kant, who divides the world between the phenomenal world of my mind uh, and the noumenal world that I can't really understand, and there's a gap between the two, so that what I see with my mind in the world may, may not really be there. What matters is what I think, and this is our culture. And as I'm reading all these philosophers, I'm thinking, as they move farther and farther away from God, it becomes more chaotic and, and complex and lost because the truth is oh so simple. There is a God. He's told you that he exists. He shows you that he exists. And he's given you enough evidence to embrace him. The day that you bow before his throne is the day that he saves you. And your life's radically changed. And uh, you who are an analytical person who never sing, you're going to start singing. Here's one song that uh, well, I used to sing. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. He left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. That's God. 
What's the chorus? Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. I'll sing it with the saints in glory. Where? Around the glassy sea of the throne of God. I plan on being there because I've accepted the evidence. I hope you're going to be there. It just takes faith in the evidence. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to open uh, Paul's uh, letter to the Romans and read what you have said about uh, general revelation and special revelation. Uh, And might those among us who don't know you come to know you in the most profound, uh, precise, amazing, life-changing way by bowing before you in faith. And we who know you, might we be compassionate, patient, caring with those who still have bought into false systems, uh, answering their questions with love, but guiding them toward truth. And may we be great lights for you in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.